any kind of responsibility. <laughs> Number one, uh, I want to give credit to Ron Carpenter, uh, who, who is the uh, pastor of Redemption World Outreach Center in Greenville, South Carolina. He does this sermon series that I'm, I'm doing in the next four weeks. He actually does at his church, did at his church several months ago. Uh, his sermon series is nine sermons long, and they're 45 minutes apiece. I have four weeks and about 45 minutes apiece. <laughs> So with that being said, I hope you brought a meal. Now, Eric has given me the next four weeks to teach my first sermon series. Uh, this will be a new experience for me, so I ask that you be patient with me as I wade through all of the information. And I tried to organize all the information I studied, but it seems that when you start discussing relationships, you can find yourself deep, deep into the rabbit hole having tea with the Mad Hatter and the White Rabbit many, many times throughout just one sermon preparation. So as a secondary disclaimer, please be patient as we wade through this plethora of information together. Now to place credit or blame where it is due, I explained to Eric a few weeks ago that these sermons are going to be a little bit longer than average. A lot, maybe a little lot longer than average. And he, his response was, I quote, bring it. <laughs> so if we run into the second service, it is not my fault. <laughs> Eric was warned. After, well, it's, I've got to blame you for everything. Somebody wearing plaid. Uh, after listening to this series, I had to assess many of my relationships and reevaluate many of them. After I finished it, I passed it on to my wife, and it has helped both of us understand some of the categories of relationships we had, including our own, and take a deep look at the boundaries, the boundaries of each of those categories. I've titled my first sermon series here to be called Shipwrecked. And the ship we're talking about here are relationships. Everyone under the sound of my voice today has been scarred by some sort of relationship. We have set expectations and have in one way or another been disappointed. We've expected this and we've got that. We've been disappointed and we've been hurt. How do we manage this? For the next four weeks, I plan, plan to dive deep into how we manage our relationships. We will talk about how to choose our friends, what we expect from our friends, and how sometimes we find ourselves caught up in what we call toxic relationships. Now the intent of this is to be a lot less preachy and a lot more teachy and passing on a lot of information uh, over the next four weeks. But like I said, there's a lot of information and is going to discuss a topic that I'm sure I'm going to miss a rabbit hole or two, so I'm not going to catch 100% of everything we know or you might know about relationships. And a lot of what I might say today, you're going to say to yourself, oh, yeah, who, who doesn't know that? But I'm going to let you know that as I listen to this ser sermon series and as I began to prepare for this one, and to, to, to disassemble his and put it together into mine, I had several revelations about things in my relationships and in my, in not only in my marriage but in my friendships as well. Some of the topics we're going to discuss are how do I categorize my relationships? What are the definitions on that category? What, how are the boundary lines on each category defined? What are my expectations of this relationship? And who belongs in what category? When we answer each one of these questions and place people in that category, we have to manage that constantly. When we get a person out of the category they belong in, a truckload of hurt is headed our way. Relationships affect everyone. Some people drudging through life are usually that way because someone has done something to hurt them. Some are cautious, bitter, angry. This is usually due to a relationship that has turned for the worse. And you can ask my wife when she first met me how bitter and angry I was. And most of that was due to relationships that ended in a bad way. Other questions we'll look at is what do I look for in a friend? And within those friendships, who are the painful or toxic people? Am I a magnet to painful people? Am I an enabler of painful people? What are some of the characteristics of painful people? Why do I attract them? Why do they keep ending up in my life? And the big one for me was, am I a painful person? Is it painful to be my friend? Today, today I want us to take a look at what we look for in a friend. We are not talking about marriage necessarily. However, all of these principles can be applied to that relationship as well. So let's get started. What do I look for in a friend? When I ask that question, some of the common answers are going to be someone who's fun-loving, easygoing, no drama, somebody that makes me laugh, someone ambitious, 
someone goal oriented. The funny thing is, with those, most of those common answers have absolutely nothing to do with character. They all have to do with personality. When we look for people to hang out with, or those acquaintances, personality traits will suffice. However, when we start looking for a more in-depth friend or that best friend, that confidant, we need to do a little more in-depth character assessment. When we look for a best friend, we need to look for character traits, not personality traits. If I find a friend and I make that friend my best friend who's fun-loving, and I tell them all of my weaknesses and all of my faults, they might have fun with some of my faults. If I have a friend who makes me laugh, he might take some of my weaknesses to make other people laugh. The tendency for us is to look at personality traits. Instead of, doing a, instead of looking at character traits in our friends, our dates, etc. Proverbs 31 tells us what to look for in a woman, and none of that has to do with personality. It all has to do with character. We all tend to base our relationships on how we feel about a person. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us about love, but none of it has to do with feelings. When we base our relationships on those butterflies in our stomach, we need to be advised... At some point in that relationship, those butterflies are going to fly out. My hope is that with today's word that you will see that there are some relationships that you need to, number one, initiate. This means we need to re maybe perhaps re-evaluate re our selection process. We may have been looking for the wrong kind of person and we may have developed some wrong relationships. There might be some relationships you need to cultivate. There may be some that have been allowed to die and we need to go back and revisit. And there are going to be some relationships that you're going to need to look at to eliminate. Some of those relationships we are now in are downright toxic and need to be ended for good. This may be a tough series. I know it was tough for me to listen to and tough for me to prepare. But let's go ahead and dive straight into God's Word. We're going to go straight to Matthew 7, 16 through 19. It says, You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Now one insert I want to throw in here is, it's amazing to see what we want in comparison to where we go to get it. Even so, every good fruit, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. And this whole section, this whole selection here, is all these are all principles. A principle is a truth that is appropriate to every person. When we begin to look for character, no one can fool me consistently. You can fool me for a lifetime with your personality. But when it comes to character, if it isn't there, you can't act like it's there for very long. If they are a liar, at some point, it's going to show up. If they're undependable, that will eventually rear its ugly head. Whatever fruit is truly there will eventually leak out. If it's an orange tree, it will produce oranges. If it's an apple tree, it's going to produce apples. The people that do not bear the fruit that God expects, we cannot give ourselves to them in a confident relationship. Now follow me here because this, is, this was the hardest part for me to grasp. And actually me and my wife both sat down and discussed this one for a long time. Is I love everybody, but I trust very few. God has commanded me to love you, but He has not commanded me to trust you. In other words, I love you by the command of God, but my trust is earned. My trust is earned as you meet qualifications to be my friend. Relationships will affect your future just as much as anything else. And there are some people that aren't qualified to be part of your life, or at least as much a part of your life. What kind of fruits are we looking for? Look at Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Long-suffering. Will you still love me when the veneer is gone and my flaws start showing? Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. This is where I start to step on, step on a few toes. And I say that because it stepped on mine. If you constantly have to tell me what you are, there's a very high chance you aren't that. If you don't have that fruit showing, 
it isn't there. You hear people say, I'm a loving person, but yet you'll watch them avoid people to avoid conversation, to avoid meeting new people. I'm a giving person, yet when they sit down for a meal, they won't even share a french fry. I'm a patient person, this is one for me, I'm a patient person until I get in Camp Lejeune traffic. <laughs> and the last one is, I'm a Christian. The bottom line is, is there really enough, ev enough evidence there on your tree to prove that? If you have to tell me you were this kind of person, that means that your tree hasn't shown me anything. I should have known all of that long before you ever said anything. We often want to people to look at our fruit, but then believe we're something else. On the flip side of that coin, sometimes we want someone in our life so bad that we'll lie to ourselves about what we are actually seeing. We often want a relationship so bad that we ignore the fruit that tells us to avoid that relationship. For me, I'm going to be honest with you. I ask you to call me what you see me. And a little later on in the sermon, I'm going to tell you how, how I see myself. But I want you to call me what you see me. Call, we, call me what you see on my tree. You need to study the fruit to see what... Study the, the fruit to see if the tree is what it really says it is. When you get it, begin, it is critical to understand the different types of relationships and parameters that make, those, make it that kind of relationship. Then to get the right person in the right category. When you begin to put expectations on a relationship that it was never designed to give, again, you're in for a truckload of hurt. We don't go to work for support. Bottom line, I'm a bottom line kind of guy. What is work? Pay me. That's the bottom line. When I go to work, I'm not there for support. I'm not there for our friends. I'm not there for best friends. I'm not there for confidants. Pay me is the bottom line. We don't sleep with friends or wake up with them either. When you do, you are making a relationship bear a weight it was never designed to bear. And you will get hurt. Relationships are not meant to operate outside certain boundaries. We don't tell an acquaintance our secrets. But he doesn't have, need, need that much information. You don't tell your problems to those that work for you. Problems always go up. Never down. If you take your problems and give them to those that work for you, guess what? That person wants your job and will use that information to get your job. Today, we're simply going to focus on the different types of people we can choose from for our relationships. Many relationships are not meant to go the distance that we have carried them to, but are meant to survive for only a season. The first one I want to look at today is constituents. A constituent is someone who's not for you, but they are for what you are for. Now, if you notice on your, on your bulletins today, I have... Each one of these categories listed out. Constituents, comrades, confidants, all the way down to the end. And take some time, just think it through. You don't have to do this today. But write down some people that you think might be fitting into that category. And where you may have placed them in the wrong category. They are for what you are for. These relationships are temporary in nature. And will come in and out of your life. Don't take them leaving personally. They are seasonal and will leave when that season of your life is finished. The second one we have is comrades. Now these are similar to constituents, except they are not for what you are for, but they are against what you are against. Hunger, homelessness, violence, etc. The list goes on and on. Common enemies. These are your allies, much like the United States have allies that we're not really friends, but we will join together to fight a, bigger, a larger enemy. Again, these are temporary in nature and will come and go as the seasons change. Now the next ones we're going to go a little bit more in depth on because it's probably one of the most important ones. Confidants. These people are into you. They are not for what you are for and they're not always against what you're against. But they love you. They will rejoice when you rejoice and they will mourn when you mourn. When you walk into a room, they will drop everything to rejoice with you or to mourn with you. Some people say if you have five of these in a lifetime, you're extremely blessed. I'll back that up and say if you have three of these in a lifetime, you're extremely blessed. They are with you when you're up and they are with you when you're down. 
A little side note here is, woe unto you if you make the constituent or the comrade your confidant. We all need a confidant in our life. James 5.16 says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. In some of my research for this message, I discovered that the word trespass here doesn't necessarily mean sin, but weakness. I cannot be healed until I get it out. Depression is nothing but the fact that I never got to talk about it. Secrets are like plutonium. They're nuclear. The only way we are healed is through confession. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When a heart cannot empty itself, the poison kills the heart. Those with no hope, vision, etc. are those that had something they needed to get out, but no one to tell it to. Again, secrets revealed in the wrong environment can become a nuclear bomb. You take that child, that child is nine years old, was raped, and doesn't talk about it until after 30 years of marriage and opens it up and gives it to her husband. The impact that it has on both of their relationships can be detrimental. Or you take that child that was molested at age six and she doesn't talk about it until she's been married for 40 years. My wife and I have experienced this, experienced this on a very personal level. And before I say this, I have discussed all of this with my wife. I've let her read this. And she's given me her permission to share part of her story or part of our story. When my wife was young, she was molested by her stepfather for many years. She held on to this for several years of our marriage. And when it finally did get revealed, it almost destroyed both of us. Because of this, she had little understanding of relationships and the boundaries within those relationships. Much of our marriage had been what she thought was expected of her to do by being a partner in the relationship. We almost had to start our marriage over to relearn and revisit re each other to find out who each other really was. And we had to establish boundaries both within our marriage and outside our marriage. We had to apply these boundaries on our own and we had to help each other maintain these boundaries. She carried that secret with her for almost 20 years and thought that it would never affect her. To think that you can carry it and not affect you makes you a fool. King David wrote of not being able to talk to anyone, but I stood there in silence, not even speaking of good things. The turmoil within me grew worse. And the Believer's Bible Commentary puts it this way, So there I was, dumb and silent, with no outlet, so with no outlet for my suppressed emotions. We've got to get it out. We've got to have someone to talk to. We all need a confidant. And you have to weigh through the crowd in a character assessment, not a personality assessment. A character assessment. Looking for that person that I can tell if I have problems with pornography, drug addiction, or even a marital affair. While you're looking for your confidant, you have to be careful of these people. The abandoners. This is the type of person that will start but never finish. They will stay with you while the shine is still on the armor, but when the shine starts to give way to cracks, they are gone because they have surface level relationships. They never stay through when the trouble hits. They are there for your successes, but they disappear when you begin to struggle. They look for perf perfect people and they will drop you in a second when they find out that you aren't it. When you are looking for a confidant, you also have to be careful of people like me. And preparing for this series, I had to come to some terms that I am this next kind of person. My wife, as difficult as it was for her to confront me, confirmed this. Next we have the critic. The critic tends to be self-righteous. They tend to be clear thinkers. They tend to have good information. They love truth. But they tend not to speak the truth in love. They tend to love the fact that they are right more than they do the relationship. 
on the positive note, they really do love truth and they really do love righteousness. But on the negative, to be close to them leaves you guilt-ridden and condemned. They always think their way is the answer to your life. And you can never tell them your problems without a sermon. They never just hear you or let you empty your heart. They have to quickly point out every one of your errors as they hear your story. They can change. They can learn love. They can learn humility. But they tend to be self-righteous. As I prepared for this, I learned that I tend to look at people's weaknesses as sinfulness. But with the help of my lovely wife, we're working on this problem. I am learning love. And I am learning humility. <clears throat> Finally, the last group we have are the irresponsibles. They are warm and fun-loving. They do care, but are very difficult to trust. They give no thought for tomorrow anywhere in their head. They live for the moment and never consider the consequences. You'll find yourself making excuses for them and covering for them because they are indeed irresponsible. <clears throat> As we seek our confidant, we must understand that no one is a perfect person. Some of our relationships need to be initiated, cultivated, and some eliminated. And as you look for this person, please understand that in the plan of God, that God has already pre-designed certain people to enter and exit your life at certain times and in certain seasons. And a very small number will go the distance. Jesus did not grow a church from small to big. He actually grew a church from great to almost nothing. He dwindled the crowd when He started demanding that you love me back. When Jesus was feeding the 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes, the crowds followed Him. But when He started talking about eating His flesh and drinking His blood, the crowds started to shrink. John chapter 6, verse 66 says, From that time, many of His disciples went back and walked with Him no more. Again, as I looked into the commentary, we word it this way. These sayings of the Lord proved so distasteful to many that followed Him, that they now left Him and were no longer willing to associate with Him. These disciples were never true believers. They followed the Lord for various reasons, but not out of genuine love for, or for Him or appreciation for who He was. You are in for a world of hurt if you are the only one in love. Now this doesn't mean start looking for that perfect person. It's not a challenge to go start looking for that perfect person to be your confidant, the one you can trust and rely on and talk to. This doesn't mean become hypocritical or worse yet, become the critic. My challenge today is not to start a search for the perfect character person, but to become it. Look at your own fruit. Look at your own tree. If you're having to tell everyone what you are, that means your tree's not showing it already. What kind of tree are you? What kind of fruit can we see on your tree? Pray with me. Father, we love you today. And we ask you today, Lord, that you will help us to see some of those openings in our relationships, some of those areas where we might need to reevaluate our relationships or reassess some of those relationships. But not to go out to try to change others or try to get others to be more like us or to fit more into our mold but that we'll begin to fit more into your mold and be that person of character that abides by your word and follows your word. We love you. Guide us today as we walk out the doors today. And as we transition now to a time of tithing offerings, the tithing offerings, I ask you, Lord, just to open our hearts to receive that word today. We love you, and we give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.